these viruses and bacteria that have really navigated the course of history in major ways. And what I'm going to suggest is that the internet is really our key to survival here. Um, and this is for three reasons. First, what the internet gives us is the ability to work remotely. And when you can work from home telepresently, what this allows you to do is, is inhibit viral transmission by reducing face-to-face -face contact, the human-to-human -human contact. So in, in the face... <laughs> so here's the idea. The next time that there's a really killer virus coming our way, if businesses are prepared in advance, what they can do is really leverage telepresence to keep supply chains running with the maximum number of employees working from home. Now, this isn't going to keep everybody off the street, um, but it's going to vastly reduce the density. And it turns out that when it comes to epidemics, that's all you need to do. You just need to get things below a tipping point. So uh, the reason viruses have this sort of tipping point is because uh, viruses have a limited lifetime and a certain probability of infecting somebody. And so if you have very low host density, then the virus dies before it can get to a new host. But as soon as you get enough people together, then it can find new hosts and you go from some sort of equilibrium state into an epidemic. It really blows up. And in fact, you can see this sort of thing happening every Christmas holiday season with people shopping in the malls because they all bunch together and then you cross over this population tipping point and then everyone gets flu and cold. Okay, so now here's the problem. In the past, societies have reacted to epidemics by bunching together. So, for example, um, in medieval Europe, when the Black Plague hit and other plagues like it, um, warring religious factions who spent all their time killing each other would, would show solidarity in the face of all this death by marching together in the streets together to show that the Catholics and the Protestants could be friends in the face of the plague. Well, that was a real misstep in terms of density. Um, and it turns out that the Native Americans, in a show of goodwill, they would gather in the tents of people who were infected with smallpox. They, everyone would gather together. And again, unfortunately, that was um, a gesture that uh, was sort of ill-fated. And so this is exactly the fear that all major medical centers have the next time we have a major uh, a new strain hitting us, whether it's avian flu or swine flu or something. The big fear that medical centers have is that everybody with a cough is going to come flocking into the med center to get checked out. And this is really dangerous. And so I think this is the second great opportunity afforded to us by the net, besides telepresence, is, is telemedicine, whereby with increasingly sophisticated technologies, we don't have to have uh, patients coming in and bunching up together, but instead we can have diagnosis from a distance. Okay, so the telepresence and the telemedicine are very useful because they keep the population density below a tipping point. I think there's a third benefit that we get from the internet, which is we can optimally direct resources when there is an outbreak. So uh, you may know that the Center for Disease Control tracks the flu uh, by tracking what happens at the local hospitals. Now the thing is it takes two weeks for the CDC to put together their report. It lags the actual flu outbreak by two weeks. So Google came up with a better idea, and what they do is they track where people are searching for terms related to the flu. So if they're searching for information on symptoms or medicines or something, it turns out that over the course of the nation, that serves as an excellent proxy for where there's a flu outbreak. So while the CDC's report lags by two weeks, Google's lags by only a day. So this gives us a very rapid way to know dynamically exactly where the flu is and where the outbreaks are, are, are happening. 